Hey, welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. I'm Dan Deppin, and today joined again by uh, your friend Moskovitz. How's it going? Hello, Dan. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, no, thanks for coming back on. It seems like like about every year or so we do this and it always goes over well. So so what have you been up to lately? Yeah, it's good. Been pretty good, Dan. Been attending some different industry conferences and events and uh, really uh, listening and and learning and seeing mm -hmm. what's going on in the in the marketplace, in the notes marketplace. Uh, see a lot of a lot of things shifting and people shifting and doing different business models, getting into different asset classes than mm -hmm. what they traditionally were focused on. And so it's all good. Um, you know, the one thing that um, the one thing that we can count on in this world is that change is always going to happen, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And some people will sit back and do nothing and complain about it. And then there's other people that will, uh, they will change as well. Change, make some adjustments, maybe pick up a new business model, pursue a new angle mm -hmm. and position themselves in the path of success, which is, it's great to see that. And, and we see this with the investors. We know we see vendors in the industry as well uh, doing this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an important uh, distinction to be, to be aware of because uh, we have to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're in an election cycle this year. Uh, so a weird election it, cycle. You need, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is, but you know what? It's like every other election cycle. Fifty percent of the time, the administration that you like is going to be in power, and then the other fifty percent of the time, they're not. And you, you have to deal with it. And so, for us as investors, we can think about, hey, what's the best way to position ourselves and our business so that we can ride the wave of of progress instead of meeting resistance and, and all that. And a lot of times the resistance is resistance. We create ourselves. It's like, we, we can't get out of our own way. So uh, I, I, I think about it from that perspective. I always look at, Hey, uh, what are, what is the smart money doing in preparation for, an election cycle and you can watch, you watch trends and, and different things and see what's, what's happening uh, and how decisions are getting made. Mm -hmm. So what kind of changes are you making in your business? Well, uh, with our business, we're really focusing and doubling down on something that's important to do all the time, which is building relationships, getting in touch with people, following up, uh, even if um, it's someone you haven't spoken with in a while, I mean, the, the notes industry is all relationship based. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's definitely an activity always too uh, important to focus on for sure. Uh, also watching very carefully the uh, real estate markets um, in our area, mm -hmm. both the residential side and the commercial side seeing yeah. what's what's going on there because there there's definitely some shifts and uh we're starting to see where how can i say this the real estate market is heading back towards possibly a more normal level the residential side where yeah. instead of uh someone listing a property for sale and within 48 hours there's all these offers coming in and uh waiving all the contingencies and all of that uh now it's starting to, t to take a little longer maybe a property that's not pristine and in the best location is now sitting for a few days where mm -hmm. in the past it wouldn't so we're seeing some things like that uh in in my local market uh, where I am in, in Philadelphia. But, you know, something else I noticed, Dan, that uh, that is, is very telling. 
uh, not too long ago, I was in downtown Philadelphia walking and I had had a long walk and it was a nice day. I said, I'm going to walk. Beautiful day out. Enjoy the day. So here I am walking. I had like, it, it was like a uh, 10 or 12 block long walk, long city blocks. Mm-hmm. And I'm walking down one of the main uh, retail commercial avenues, uh, Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, Chestnut Street, Walnut Street. These are um, in in that area of downtown, you know, very nice, very upscale, always had nice shops and retail and restaurants and all that. And I'm walking down this one stretch where I hadn't been in a long time. And you don't experience this when you drive down. But when you're walking, you really experience it. And and I'm looking and I just see vacant storefront. Mm-hmm. Keep going. Another vacant commercial space uh, that looks like it's been like this for an extended amount of time. Uh, another commercial space was like a beauty uh, spa, like a nice spa closed mm-hmm. uh, with a four, you know, available sign on it. So, I'm just seeing over and over again vacancy, commercial vacancies in in these retail and commercial locations, and it was really really hit home. And you hear about it, but when you walk down a block where it used to be like everything was occupied and flourishing with business, and now it's just not like that anymore. Yeah, so that, that really that- hits home. Yeah, downtown Denver has a similar phenomenon. If people are familiar with that, like the 16th Street Mall is not what it used to be. And I think a lot of that is the um, uh, the rental rates for office space are way down, even though companies like Amazon that, that I used to work for are doing things to try to get people into the office. But a lot of those other like restaurants and other yeah. supporting businesses downtown kind of fall off it, it's it's interesting at least in denver though when you go outside of the don't really call it that but kind of what, what is kind of like the central business district to the more mm-hmm. like residential areas but in the city those are really thriving mm. in there but the ones that are um, a little more contingent on people doing stuff at lunch when they're in the office and yeah. things like that there it's very very different story yeah yeah yeah, it is, and and uh, I mean, we'll see what's going to happen with with that um, over time. Um, I have a feeling it's gonna it's gonna take some time to to play out. But uh, yeah, yeah, there's I- definitely a lot of of uncertainty, and and uh, people are very cautious. I'm seeing investors at all levels very cautious. Mm-hmm. Deals are getting done, but it's not at a level like we're used to seeing Mm -hmm. well like where are you starting to see people do deals now and in in notes are they in notes a lot of it is individual uh investors to investors or a note fund that maybe is closing down and they're uh, selling off the tail of their portfolio we see that um not seeing big 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 transactions yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing similar things. And those like the, the fund wind downs are like my favorite yeah. opportunities because the seller's actually serious <laughs> about selling. Yeah. They're and serious you and, and you can get things done. Exactly. Things aren't going to drag out and um, they're working against deadline as well. The seller is. So that keeps everyone engaged and keeps the process moving along. Yeah. And when you're serious about buying and they know you're going to close it, then they're down to work with you. And yeah, that just goes a lot, a lot smoother. So true. So true. So you're seeing the same from, from your perspective as well. Yeah. And and I'm seeing more availability and interest in other, uh, beyond single family homes. So seeing a lot of land notes and notes on mobile homes and things like that as well so i haven't bought any land notes yet i have one mobile home deal and in, in my self-directed ira that i'm working on but uh yeah 
I love doing doing deals in self-directed IRA. That's that's one of my favorite strategies. That's powerful. Yeah, yeah. for for those of us as node investors, I always say we do you know do your transactions and you do like you do, but always try to work one in from time to time in your self-directed account. It's powerful and um, you're building wealth where it's not being um, subjected to taxes right away. And that helps so much. The growth path is uh, significantly faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to wait a little bit to get to the money, but yeah. Yeah. But that's but it's, all. Yeah. You're working with money. You don't need, you don't need today and that's fine. Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, I myself have always been a long-term uh, investor, long-term outlook, and that's the approach I, I do uh, business and do transactions, and so I think it really makes a difference. It really does. Yeah, my approach is similar, especially in my self-directed IRA. Like I want stuff I can hold for a long time, and when I buy in my self-directed IRA, I'm not necessarily trying to optimize for for price necessarily like i'll take a lower yield if it's going to be something that is going to be stable and i'm not going to have to mess with mm -hmm. over time outside of the self-directed area i'll take on whatever but yeah. yeah that that's great um so some other things that um that i've been really focusing on is Working on systems in my in my business, CRM, mm -hmm. getting that tightened up. What, uh, what CRM do you use? Um, I use several different ones actually. So I I like PipeDrive. That's that's mm -hmm. been really good. Uh, Zoho is very good as well. It's very customizable, mm -hmm. and um, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer when it comes to a CRM. The best one that you can use is the one that you use. Yeah, I, I agree. I use PipeDrive, and I don't, I don't know if you did the same thing as me, but several years ago, Adam Adams made a bunch of videos on setting up PipeDrive for notes. Oh, really? And I, and I took that, and then I made a boatload of modifications to do it the same mm -hmm. way that I do. And somebody was asking about that a while back. I went looking. I think he nuked his channel, so I don't think they're available Okay. I yeah. wasn't aware of that. Yeah. But yeah, I, this was I, like six or seven years ago. I found yeah. pipe drive to be very robust. Mm -hmm. It's very robust. The support is excellent. If you're trying to do something and you can't figure out, you can open a support ticket and get an answer mm -hmm. relatively quickly, which is nice. I, I should know this, but does it, do you, do you ever use it for um, creating documents? No, as a because I know that Zoho does a really good job of that. I haven't used Zoho, but I've worked with people who have, yeah. and it's been on my list to look and see if PipeDrive does that. Because one of the things I do, whether it's um, you know, like a joint venture agreement or some kind of loan agreement, I have mail merge docs, mm -hmm. and so I can just put for like documents I'm creating over and over. I can put all the relevant information in a spreadsheet and then turn the crank and it spits out the doc. I know that Zoho mm -hmm. and others have some capabilities where it kind of integrates with the CRM so you can create a document and then it'll also have its own kind of like DocuSign function where you can send it out and it's all contained within the CRM. Monday.com does that as well. I'm sure there's like, it's like all those things. There's probably a hundred different software tools that, that will do the job in some way or another. Yeah, there, there is for sure. Uh, it's a matter of, but it's an investment. It's an investment of time and money to get that set up. If it's something you you're using over and over again, then it's absolutely worth it to do it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if you can't figure out, then just hire it out. You can hire a consultant to just do one project for you, and they'll probably be able to crank it out in a day or two, and you'll be up and running. Yeah, because one of the things I like about the business is it's fairly rinse and repeat. Like even though no two loans are the same, the the whole flow of finding them and making offers and buying them and running the portfolio 
you're kind of repeating the same things over and over. So it, it lends itself to, to automation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we caught up. So last time we caught up live was a couple months ago at DME uh, in Nashville. So did you have any big takeaways from that show? The biggest takeaways for me was um, really hearing and, and through conversations with investors and through some of the panels that were up on stage was about <clears throat> node investors branching out in different asset classes mm -hmm. where um, maybe someone that was focused exclusively on, on institutionally originated nodes Maybe they ventured out into seller financing notes and started pursuing that or doing uh, doing some different marketing efforts. And mm -hmm. uh, and so that's always been, uh, yeah, something that, that you see that uh, that there's all within note investing, there's so many different niches, right? We know that. And um, sometimes you, you, be you can be open to considering something you you didn't normally do or um, didn't pursue, but now there's there may be an opportunity there. So all of a sudden it becomes more uh, worthwhile to look at it, consider it, maybe do a couple transactions, see if it if it's going to work for you or not, and then you can expand if if it's uh, a positive experience. And so I feel like th there's been a lot of that. I was on a panel. Um, panel with other node investors and all of us on the panel, we were all in very different uh, niches of, of node investing where, where we were active. And, uh, you know, there's, there's always opportunities out there. And so if you're able to position yourself appropriately, then you can be really well set up for success. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I swear I didn't set you up for that, but I, I ran a, a free workshop a couple of weeks ago. And in part of it, I talked about how market conditions will always change over time. And so your ideal deal type, whether it's like the asset type, performing, non-performing for a second, like that's going to evolve over time. So if you know like yeah. the basic concepts you can involve you can evolve your model because I've seen a lot of people get stuck where they're they either um yeah I only you know, want to buy notes on blue houses yeah or that are two or, story and nothing else or I only buy non-performing seconds that I can get for five cents on the dollar because I heard that in 2013 somebody did this and it worked out really great so I'm looking for that and then they're not a, of course they just don't exist really anymore and then you know they end up just sitting on yeah. their hands. But I think one of the cool things about notes is there's so many asset types and different deal structures and deal types. You can always find something that makes sense given the, given the market conditions. And then I was doing this like mental exercise of like, okay, well, what would be the market? What would be the toughest market to come up with anything? And that's probably very low levels of distress, low interest rates, yada, yada. And that was kind of the market from like 2021-ish, mm -hmm. you know, 2022. And I still found stuff to buy in that yeah. time frame, you know? No, absolutely. You know a lot of people and those relationships, that's what gets you exposure and opportunities for uh, for for doing transactions. You, you, you've got to know people, you need to be known, putting yourself out there, um, which may be uncomfortable for a lot of, a lot of folks, but uh, let's face it, our industry, it's a small world, isn't it, Dan? We all know mm -hmm. each other. Uh, everyone knows each other. And so the relationships, the personal relationships is really important. Yeah. And I think letting people know what you're looking for is key as well because that's where i get some of my best deals when somebody has an investor they need to liquidate or they they want to move money into something else and then they call me or email me and say hey dan are you interested in buying this yeah like those are the the best ones because if you have a reputation for closing yeah because there's so many it's a small world but a lot of people are flaky like if people know what you want and they know you'll 
close on it, presuming there's not some fatal flaw in it. Um, but yeah, then a lot of times stuff will just tend to find you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you want to be the first call that someone makes when they're looking to sell a note. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so what do you see coming down the pike for the, the rest of the year? Like what, what are you going to be focused on? For, uh, for the rest of the year, focusing on, um, on the relationships we have, um, we're working through the portfolio ongoing, uh, that mm -hmm. work never stops. Uh, but really it's, uh, having lots of conversations. I spent a lot of time on the phone speaking with investors, speaking with vendors and, um, you know, getting to share what, uh, experience there is what's happening. And, um, Watching the real estate market, the real estate market, especially residential, is a good leading indicator for us in the notes business because there's a there's a lag behind what's happening in real estate. And so you can always watch what's the current average days on market, you know, right in your, your local county. You can watch that. Mm -hmm. And look for changes and see. And then, of course, uh, you can sample other areas, other geographic locations as well, because real estate is always local. And yeah. there's trends. There's trends always nationwide trends. And that's what you you hear uh, reported in the media and different things. And then we have interest rates, right, which is just constantly going up and down and you never know when someone at the Fed wants to pull a lever and it mm -hmm. impacts interest rates, which has a whole cascading effect of its own. Yeah. Yeah. One of the nice things about interest rates where they are now is, you know, interest rates on newly originated seller finance loans are going to be somewhat higher. And so I feel like it's creating more opportunity. There, I even talked to some people at DME who were table funding new seller financed deals, mm. right? So they're not getting a discount when they do that, but they're getting uh, fairly high rates of return. You know, so if you have a note that's like well underwritten with a large down payment, you know, those can be pretty nice. And they were um, originating those notes and then reselling them on the secondary market. Or holding no, for, the, the, for the, yield. the one conversation I'm thinking of is, yeah, he was holding them mm -hmm. for yield. And these were um, originated with very high down payments through a fully licensed RMLO. So really like basically bank quality hmm. paper to the point where he could get loans from a bank against his portfolio. And so he was doing kind of like basically using a bank to kind of hypothecate yeah. against them, but not totally refinancing himself out. So he was getting this, you know, fairly high rate of return and then levering that up mm -hmm. with, with, with the bank funds. But, you know, I think they were getting like 25, 30% down payments at sale prices that made sense. And so, yeah, it seemed like, like pretty good deals. That's a great strategy. It's, um, it's not unlike the idea about having a note and then selling a partial on that note. It's a similar Similar idea, except that the investor in this case is is an institutional lender or bank, right? Mm -hmm. They're lending against that, but it's not much different than selling an individual partial. And um, I love partials, especially for like we were talking before about self directed accounts. If you have small ones, small balance, like an HSA. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe you just opened up a Roth IRA recently. Um, that's a great place to start with a partial. Like when I started my HSA, I was doing partials because I didn't have a lot of money. And in the first couple of years, it's small. And so you get a couple of partials going and that builds up growth and momentum. And then before you know it, your uh, account value just starts to grow and build momentum and it's all happening tax-free, which is uh, really powerful. So I, I love that um, 
for things like partials because people need to recapitalize. And so if you know enough investors, it's not going to be too hard to find uh, someone that wants to sell a partial. And it's probably someone you know well. Yeah. And when I was at the the paper source seminar with Tom Henderson, I don't know if you ever heard him talk about his 10 for 12 partial, but what he likes to do is offer people, especially if you have like a small amount of money Mm -hmm. you want to deploy, you can offer somebody say, I'll buy 12 payments for the price of 10 and it's counterintuitive, but it works out to like over a 30% yield till it's all said and done. Um, so, so I haven't actually done that strategy myself, but that seems like kind of a cool strategy. If you had a small amount of money in an HSA or, yeah. you know, maybe it's like a new account that doesn't have much, much well, in there. I invite you to do it, do it. And maybe the next, next time we talk on a podcast interview, you can tell me about how it went. Yeah, I need to do that. Cause he, Tom had his, uh, th- there was a workbook that, came with it with the slides. And then I bought this other workbook from them for like $20 in, in cash. Um, and there's a lot of really creative stuff mm. in there. It, it would be fun as like a test case to try to put some of that stuff into action. Where, where I struggled with it a little bit was I would just have to spend some time and money getting the paperwork set up to do it one time. But, you know, then once you have it, it it's a little bit easier yeah, to rinse, to rinse and repeat, um, and then also a lot of the calculations don't factor costs, so you'd have to just make sure that stuff's still made. Yeah, so no, you're going to have transaction costs to get that set up, but uh, yeah, if the numbers work, then it's good. And you know, a lot of the leading servicers they do a pretty good job with partials. They can set them up for you. If you want them to do the paperwork, they can do that. If you, you know, if I know you FCI know. has some good programs for that. Yeah, yeah, a few cool. different. All the leading servicers, they they they're well versed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with partials, and so uh, if it's something you're thinking of exploring, call the servicer you use that you have a relationship with, and ask them about it, and ask them are they able to support you on a partial transaction. And you can get a feel for how the how the process works with your servicer, and um, and then you'll have a better comfort level when you go out and talk to someone about this. Yeah. So, without well, well, get into the hard questions, so what? Any um, what, what, what's your biggest pet peeve in in the note industry that you'd like to see fixed? Um, something that really comes to mind, um, and I noticed this through some of the conversations I've had, is um, sometimes you talk to people, you meet an investor, and they're all excited, but they can't get out of their own way, and they don't end up doing anything. And then you might go back the next year to the same conference and see that person and talk to them again. And they'll be in the same place where they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. That pains me to, to see that, to see someone that's struggling in that way. Um, And I think a lot of it comes down to who are, who are the people that you're uh, putting yourself around who are you listening to? Who are you learning from? Who are your colleagues that you have relationships with? Uh, I think that really matters a lot. Mm-hmm. It really does. Uh, I always think of that famous that famous quote from Jim Rohn that you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And in the context of investing, it's like who's on, who's your 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 closest people, the people that you're on speed dial with in your phone and you talk to them on a regular basis and um, support each other, support each other, bounce ideas off of each other and uh, encourage and uplift, right? Yeah, that's, that's a good what one. helps everyone. I, I Yeah, I, I quit a job once after doing that exercise <laughs> to round at it and you're like, these are not the people I want to, I want to turn into. 
Yeah. Yeah, cool. It it matters because it rubs off on you. And yeah, let's say in the in the case of a job, a place you're working, is is it a place that has a toxic culture, toxic environment? Uh, or is it a place where you're being mentored, you have a good manager, they're watching out for you and and mentoring you to uh progress in your career? And you know, are you working with a good team with colleagues that have your back and you mm-hmm. have their back, right? This is a very different environment. And you're spending a lot of your life at work, right? So may yeah. as well be in a good environment, a positive environment. And if it's not, maybe it's time to reconsider where you are and looking at some other options. Yeah, I, I, I've worked in those healthy environments. I've also worked in a few where it's like every man for himself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Yeah. Cool. Well, well, Fred, thanks for joining us again. I really appreciate it. How, how can people connect with you? I'll put your links in the, the notes, but how can people get a hold of you? Thank you. Uh, best way to get a hold of me is to visit my website, which is fredmoskowitz.com. And if you prefer an easier spelling, you can go to giftfromfred.com and that'll take you right to my website, can connect with me there. Always love hearing from other investors and building relationships because it's such an important part of what we do. Thank you for having me on, Dan. It's been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, anytime. All right, have a good one.